the associate head coach strength and conditioning coach for UConn. Um, Chris is uh, currently, like I just said, coach at UConn. He's working directly with the men's basketball and women's, men's and women's basketball and soccer teams. Prior to appointment at the University of Connecticut, he served as an athletic trainer at, at St. Louis University and was later appointed as strength and conditioning coordinator. Chris West has also <coughs> had experience serving strength and conditioning coordinator and athletic training internship with the Oakland Raiders, the uh, Los Angeles team, and a graduate of assistantship with the Seattle Seahawks. Chris earned his bachelor's from Cal State Long Beach in physical education and master's degree in exercise and movement science from the University of Oregon. Chris has held certifications from National Strength and Conditioning Association as certified strength and conditioning specialist Nas the National Athletic Training Association as a certified trainer and um, the National Academy of Sports Medicine as a performance enhancement specialist. Let's bring Chris up with a nice round of applause, Steve. Thanks, Danny, thank you. Okay, so um, I think, uh, again, you know, good size for this as we're gonna go through this. Uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about today has to do with the uh, use of technology, right? Uh, it's everywhere in, in what we do. We see it everywhere in everything we're doing. You see all the different uh, devices out there that you're looking at from, you know, the, you know, My Fitness Pal, all the different apps. The iPhones now come preloaded with stuff. But, you know, we're in a real age of, of kind of quantifying things, right, of taking data and data analytics and these types of things. So, you know, one of the things that, that's starting to become more and more used and more and more uh, dominant in the field is everyone wants to gain that extra edge, that extra advantage, right? So part of these things are being able to monitor, pick out the outliers, manipulate uh, individual variables for certain individuals throughout the course of the season. These are all the things that some of this technology helps us to do. Um, so today we're gonna go over some of the, 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 how we use this for monitoring our daily training session load and look at, at how that has gone through. If, were any of you in at the field session uh, yesterday? Okay, so if you were at the field session, what it'll do is I'll show you some of that data today, and we're going to go through that as well. So again, one of the big uh, kind of capture points here is that, um, let's see if we can get this real quick here. Okay, so again, right, first of all, what we have to kind of talk about if we're going to look at, at what are we measuring, right? What are we looking to, to measure? What are we looking to modify as we go through? And in this context, we talk a lot about training load, right? So we're gonna look at this a little bit, training load. And really when we talk about training load, we're talking about stress, right? And, and how much do we stress our players, right? Do we stress them enough, right? Do we stress them too much is the question, right? The question that I get from our head coach just about every day of the week as we go through is, his ultimate question is he wants to know, are we fit, right? That's what he wants to know. He wants to know, are we fit? He wants to know, do you think we're tired today? Do you think we're tired coming off of this last week where we had to play two games, three games, and I'll tell you what, on average, we've averaged this season about 3.2 matches per week. So any of you in the college realm, you know part of the big factor in, in um, uh, of the season is number one, it's very short. It's about four months in duration. Uh, number two, it's very congested. So you have a lot of matches within a short period of time. So managing your players, managing how much you load them during the course of your training sessions, your matches, becomes very important because ultimately what you need to have is their preparedness or their readiness to perform in the match coming up. So again, first thing is defining that training load and defining the stress, how much stress we put on them as we're going through, and then what types of stress, what types of stress we're putting on them. Second thing is what do we monitor, right? What are we looking for when we're talking about monitoring stress? What factors do we monitor in there? And there's two main factors that you hear people talk about when it comes to managing trailing load. And that is the first one, uh, effort, right? How much players effort are putting out there and that is referred to more of as internal load. And then there's the work component of it, right? How much work they're actually doing with the external load. Now again, I've used polar uh, heart rate for, for uh, many years probably, uh, you know, over 10 years now going through this. And one of the things that first started happening when we looked at this was we looked at heart rate and we looked at loads at heart rate. And what coaches tend to find and they look at and what do coaches wanna see when they look at uh, effort or, or heart rate? What do they wanna see? They wanna see who's working hard and who's not working hard, right? Now, one of the fundamental problems with that is is that if you're not fit, 
you're working really, really hard, right? And work is the wrong word again here, right? Your effort is extremely high. But the work you do may not be very high, right? So again, for some of the coaches looking at this information, you're trying to show them the data and you're saying, look, right, this guy has a really high effort today. And he looks and he said, you know what? He's the least fit guy on our team. He's the biggest dog on our team, right? But now with the addition of the GPS, we're able to now look at the GPS and accelerometry. We're able to now look at how much work they're actually doing. So we see the effort that they're putting out there and we see the work that they're accomplishing in there. And a lot of this, you start to get an efficiency ratio, right? It's just like in your car, miles per gallon. You know, how much, how efficient is this player at accomplishing a high amount of work with a low amount of effort? So these are some things we consider. We're gonna spend a good uh, amount of time looking at just session examples and some of the information that we pull out of the, uh, the software. And then starting to talk about how we structure that stress application over the course of time. So the first piece is looking at, you know, kind of what are those stresses going through and how we manage them. Okay, so I popped this up because this is a really cool visual of uh, a match, uh, one of our players during a match this year. So again, what we can see here, and we can start to look at this information and start to say, you know, okay, what we're seeing in the top in the red line here is his heart rate curve, right? So really we're just describing what happened at this point. So we see a heart rate curve and down below we see a speed uh, curve in here. So this is his velocity going through. And again, you can see the one thing, what type of sport is soccer? It's a high intensity intermittent sport, right? And clearly, right, you see this. We don't need this information to show us this, but clearly you see events where heart rates are staying relatively high, but the work rate within that uh, uh, section is, is, is very variable, right? High intensity effort, recover. High intensity effort, recover as we go through. And then one of the really cool features that this has in it too, uh, that's fun to look at as we go through is the heat map piece of this. And so we'll look at some different examples of, of the heat map and what we'll look at with that as we go through. But again, just describing those loads, right? And, and looking at, you know, let's start to describe and define those loads just over time. What we can see here is number one, and it may be very difficult to see on these slides, but uh, uh, his heart rate average over the course of this match was 82%. Right, you've got a minimum, you've got a maximum. The distance he covered during the course of this match, this particular player, uh, covered 12.5 kilometers during the course of a match. Okay, 12.5 kilometers during the course of a match. And I'll tell you, how many matches do we play in over the course of a week? Right, two, three, right? We had four matches over a nine day period this year. Right, so in those four matches, if this player is putting out four matches over nine days, this guy's putting out probably around 48, right, 45, to 50 kilometers of distance in that week, right? So again, what's the value of gathering this information? What's the value of gathering some of this data? Yeah, we know four matches in nine days, the guy's gonna be tired. We expect that he did a lot of work, but to be able to start to look at, okay, how much work did he did? So, and then we start to define that work, right? So we can break that work down, say, okay, of that 12.54 kilometers he covered during a match, how many sprints did he do? What was his average speed, right? His average speed was 6.1 kilometers per hour. And what was his maximum speed? And that's a variable that we're gonna look at a little bit more in depth is that maximal speed number. And, and even more so as we move forward in defining uh, load over time, all right? Because first thing is, let's look at what we're doing within a session. Uh, and then we're gonna define, was that enough, right? Because that's the ultimate question. We can figure out what we did, we can show all that. But the ultimate question is, well, we did that 12.4, was that enough? Was that high, was that low? How do we need to prepare to do that? So with that in mind, move over and look at um, some of the things that we're monitoring in here. So again, one of the key factors that I'll tell you of all the things is, is also uh, fundamental is duration, right? The duration. So your training duration, right? Matches, games, uh, um, training sessions over the course of the week, is, is extremely important, right, in how, uh, the, how you end up loading those players. So we have that one. Second one is looking at that internal load, looking at the heart rate, and then obviously looking at speed and distance uh, to determine, again, right, how much stress we're putting on our players as we go through. So if we go and we look at, now if you're at the session yesterday, right, um, again, you know, number one, kudos to the kids that were there. They did a really good job of going through this. But what we had during the course of that session was you can see the overall outline of it here, right? So we went about 49 minutes, 50 minutes, call it, right? We went through a period of just physical warm-up. 
Then we went into a little bit of a technical warm up. We went into some uh, speed or velocity prep work, getting them stride open as they're going through so that we could get into some really explosive pattern play type of work. Then we played a little 2v2 and a little 6v6 plus two. Now again, the real interesting thing just to look at here from kind of a, a you know, 10,000 foot view is the difference between players that we saw and the distance that they covered over the course of this entire session. So the, the difference in the range uh, in, in these four individuals, and I just pour, pulled four out because it's easier to look at these four data points than it is to look at the 16 we had. But we pull these four data points out, and you've got a range from 3.2 kilometers to 3.4 kilometers in there. So from a distance standpoint, we control things pretty well, right? Now, how do we control those things? How do we control that distance? You know, we had pretty much some grid set up, and we'll show the individual drills in here, but we controlled for that distance. So again, for the most part, we had that good control of distance going in here. You look at our max speeds ranging from, uh, you know, 23 to around 27.2 as we go through there. So, you know, again, we start to look at some of this information and being able to define um, what, what, what level or what uh, uh, threshold does a player need to have to be successful, right? So, again, if a player is covering three kilometers in a match, probably he's not going to be very successful playing at a higher level, right? So we start to identify some of these thresholds with the ability to capture and collect some of this data as well. So if we took it a little bit, just uh, uh, now breaking it down, that first section that we did, that warm-up section in there, we spent about four or five minutes going through the warm-up in. Again, if you saw that warm-up just from a basic pattern in, we had the players jog up, jog around, jog in, and get them through. Now the goal at that point was, again, warm-up obviously, right? But what we started to see was we start to see heart rates rise, kind of stabilize in here, then we threw in a little bit of dynamic stretching, right? See things come down so we get some stability in there. Again, from a distance distribution, we're looking at about half a kilometer going through. Speeds are relatively moderate, right? 14 to 16 as we go through. But again, we start to get an idea of that warm up piece that went through there. We brought them into a little technical component, same pattern, but now they play the ball. Play, follow, right? This guy's gonna play the ball up. He's gonna receive here, turn, dribble, play the ball down, right? He plays it in and we follow the same pattern back. And now you see as we integrate the ball and the passing, right? We actually see, and probably has also a function of time, but we see those heart rates start to come up a little bit higher. And look at now the work rates or the speeds covered. Again, that very high intensity intermittent component in there. Not really great high velocities, but again, we can see that in there. Now, the point in doing this, and again, this gets a little, uh, um, uh, not intricate, but, uh, but, but fine detail in here is, what we can do is as we go through our sessions, we label our sessions with what we do. So we can start to be able to say, hey, how much did we get out of this session, right? When do we get the maximum velocities? In what drills do we get that in? In what exercises, right, do we get very high heart rate response, but maybe low speed response going through? Because these variables and how we manipulate these variables are gonna help us be able to structure our training over the course of the week, right? If we wanna have a low intensity training day, because maybe we're, you know, played uh, uh, the day before or coming off an off day, right? How are we gonna wanna structure that? Do we wanna do a lot of transitional elements? Do we wanna do a lot of possessional elements? And again, some of these things are relatively intuitive, but you would be surprised as we look at some differences coming out uh, in a couple of slides, the difference between players and how things that you perceive should be happening and how they actually happen as they go through. So now we break them in and, um, we do our speed work. So we do our speed work in the same way, right? Same pattern as we go through. So again, you'll see everything be pretty simple here. But now if you were to take a look at some of the max velocities, we're starting to get guys going up. So that first 12 minutes of work that we did was really primarily about that warm up period, right? Cardiovascular system, right? Metabolic system, getting things kind of cooking in there and progressively building the speed as we go through. And you'd be able to see that if uh, maybe it's a little larger on here that that speed progressively increases as we uh, go through that warm up period. Now we get into kind of the, the meat and potatoes of what I was trying to accomplish with this session. And that was to look at velocity, right? To look at speed efforts in here. And we've talked about the importance of speed and everybody knows the importance of speed efforts during the course of a match, right? We can look at total distance, but we know it's high intensity intermittent. The other thing that we tend to see, right? And we saw it in the session yesterday, as the session goes on, when they were playing, spaces open up, right? more space opens up, which allows a player with good speed to exploit that space much better. If you were to look at our matches over the course of the season, 
And, you know, again, we're, we're UConn. That's, that's what it is. It's uh, uh, not good. It's not bad. It's not anything. But, you know, a lot of the teams that we play, uh, you know, we have a very possession style of play. We keep the ball. A lot of the teams we play will sit in against us, right? And they'll sit in, and it comes to us being able to try to break them down, right? Trying to break 10 players down, which is one of the most difficult things you can do in sport, right? But what we tend to see is as that game moves on, right, and fatigue from both teams starts to set in, spaces open up. And our ability to use some of the athleticism we have with our players and exploit those spaces is critical at those times, right? So that speed component is very important as we go through. So what we obviously want to do, right, and very simple, if you want to run fast, what do you, or you, if you want to if you want to be fast, what do you got to do? You got to run fast, right? So again, you've got to kind of train what you're doing. And one of the things we tried to, you know, uh, um, uh, mimic here in this session was just a guy's again change of pace getting out sprinting over the course of 10 15 meters as we're going through so there was a little combination play this player overlaps sprints in and the players yesterday really did a good job of holding the runs making sure that sprint was maximal and again as we go through on this pattern play now we start to see some of the max velocities that we saw during the course of the match right players up around 26 right how high is that relative and that's the thing with a lot of this information. We could say, oh, 26, right? Great. Or, you know, 12.5 kilometers. That's great. One of the things you have to start to understand as you're looking at this information is putting it in context, right? Putting it in some type of framework. If you look at top level, top caliber players, right? Sprint speeds, typically 29, 30, 30 plus low 30s kilometers per hour in there. So it gives us a little context of what our players are capable of as we go through. So again, point being is that we look at this breakdown, we start to now see these spikes in speed as we're going through, right? Relatively low intensity, low velocity, boom, acceleration, fire out. So again, this type of system that we're training is we're looking for that maximum velocity, right? We're looking for that anaerobic power output, and we're also looking for that repeated output. So do we see over the course of time that maximum velocity as he goes through decrease? And again, this isn't enough of a sample size or enough of a thing to say it's decreasing over time. This particular individual I'm looking at here in the blue, he did four reps, all right? Of those four reps, who knows what could happen at this point in time. Maybe the ball was played poorly, maybe something happened. But again, over, over a, a bigger uh, sample area, we're able to see that, and we'll look at that trend over the course of some matches as well. Yes? Uh, I'm sure that that's, uh, that's possible um, within the context of, of this. Uh, yep. Yeah, and that gets a lot more into the tactical side of things. And, but it's, it's a great point, right? But this is something that I think um, we've got to be a little bit cautious with in uh, – in making determinations of success. And one of the things in, in the second presentation I'm gonna talk about today is what is performance, right? And how do we determine what performance is? Because if we put it on wins and losses, right? Some of this stuff doesn't necessarily uh, play out. Ultimately, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for what gives us the best probability of performing. When we talk about physical variables, what we're talking about is what gives us the best probability, right? The best uh, uh, chance to have a high physical performance. Right, so, so again, it's, it's a great point, and that's uh, something I'll be talking about in the next session, but the difference between, um, you know, looking at how do we determine performance when it's, when it's very, it's, it really is multifactorial. So, uh, again, the next thing we went into now is the 2v2, right? 2v2 sessions in there, and again, we kept it relatively short, right, to uh, a minute matches. You can see in the course of that minute, this particular group, these two individuals who played together, Right? In the course of that minute, they got their heart rate up uh, significantly over that course of time. Right? So there was this rapid rise in heart rate as we go through. So again, we're stressing kind of that real anaerobic power component of the system there. And again, you look at their velocities as they go through. Now, this becomes a little interesting as we look at this, right? Because we talked about that trend in time of velocities and speeds. You look at the first match compared to the second match compared to the third match in here. Right? And again, you look at some of these heart rate curves, what happens, right? We see them starting to get up into the red. This guy's starting to touch the red. Now they're both up a little bit higher. So potentially what we're seeing within this is we're seeing that their velocities are going down, their efforts going up, right? So their efficiency 
is probably getting a little bit less efficient, right? Because potentially from a fitness standpoint, we're starting to see some type of threshold that's coming in there. So again, point being is this, you know, your ability to look at these different factors, right? And ask better questions. The one thing I can tell you is that if I were to look at any one of these things, I'm not gonna be able to answer anything for you, right? I'm not a palm reader. I don't sit, you know, back in the back and come up with some, you know, grand seer conclusion of things. What we look at is over the course of time, what are those factors that tend to, we tend to see those trends with over time? And certainly, again, there's many factors that go into it, but some of the things that we look at with this give us an idea of what actually are we seeing compared to what potentially we, we were anticipating getting as we go through. So now they went into the 6v6, right? 6v6 plus two section. And again, you know, you look at, uh, uh, you know what, one quick point, 2v2, just one thing going back there. Again, we can see those velocities change. We can see those uh, uh, running velocities change in here. But uh, when we look at that absolute running velocity, that, that average speed, 4.5, it's not very high. Now, why is that? The space is too small. That's 100% right. The space is too small. So one thing that we know, right, what do we tend to do a lot of, and I feel I see this consistently, and I've you know, kind of talked with a couple of colleagues, and they feel too, right, is we are, are always working, not always, but we see a lot of training now done in small spaces, in tight spaces, right? Which is very good potentially for technical, right? Potentially for tactical speed of thought and action, uh, but not necessarily speed of action, right, as we go through. So when you now take it from a small side of possessional game, that's not directional, right? This was directional, but again, the space, space was very small. And now into an open field, right? Uh, and you're not doing that enough. You're not accommodating. You haven't developed the stress tolerance to open up those sprints. Right? And how many times do we sprint in a match over 20 meters? It doesn't happen very often, does it? The majority of sprints, something like 80, 85% of the sprints done during the course of a match are under 10 meters. Right? But what happens when we do? Right? What happens in, that, uh, in, those, in the 15% of times when you have to sprint over that, are you prepared to do that? Are you physically accommodated to handle that stress? Right? Dave Tenney was in here and he was showing a, a video of Josie Altador in the World Cup pull his, pull his hamstring. And again, nobody can, nobody's going to sit up here and tell you why that happened. Right? But I can tell you one thing. The stress he put on himself at that moment was greater than the stress that he could tolerate. Right? Now, why couldn't he tolerate that stress? Well, that's a big question. But the whole factor with this is, is his ability to tolerate the stress he tried to impose at that point in time wasn't enough. Right? So as we go through, and we saw the 6v6 next coming up, and we saw the velocities going low. Now we open the field up a little bit. Uh, but again, the space was still relatively tight for what we had available for us in there. But you do see some of these speeds. Now we went from 4.5 meters per second average uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, meters per second average, to um, you know, 6.7 was our, our, our average speed in there. So again, you see definitely as that space increased, right, the player's velocities, average velocities increased as well as we're going through. So with these things in mind, right, um, let me take you and, and take you now to one of our training sessions that we did in the last quarter of our season. All right, so, you know, again, we've, we've gone a couple of months of training now. This is one particular session. And the thing that I want to start to emphasize with this is this is one of our players. Happens to be a defensive midfield in here. One of our sessions as we go through, look at the distance that he's covered in this session. Nine kilometers, right? Covered nine kilometers in a training session that was in the last quarter of our season, right? When I've told you we're playing three plus matches in the course of a week, okay? So again, right, is that too much? Well, you know what, and, and we can we can probably say that, that's something we're gonna talk about a little bit more in the next session, right, is, is how much is too much? How do you know when you've done too much? How do you know when you haven't done enough? But the point being is this player covers a tremendous amount. His maximum speed though, 24.8, right? We just saw 66 plus two with guys four years his junior with max speeds higher than that, okay? So interesting, right? Not coming out and saying, okay, if this, then this, but we start to see a trend there that happens and, and some things that are going on in there, okay? So um, again, even from a heart rate standpoint, again, you can see there's a pretty high heart rate exertion here, especially in a couple points going through. This is the uh, uh, satellite image of our training grounds 
overlaid with that particular session for the heat map of that session. And so looking at this next individual. Now, we just looked at a, a holding midfielder, right? This is more of an attacking midfielder. Yes? Yeah, and you know, I think that uh, in that in that line of thinking, what I would say is, um, no, yeah, this is what I would take to the coach in, in this situation. Again, number one, we've got a lot of positional dependencies going on here, and we'll see the next guy who's actually attacking midfielder who plays a little bit more free and his variation. But one, there's a positional uh, kind of variation dependency in there. The the other one is, and the reason I'm I'm putting these uh, heat maps on here with our field is to show you the spaces that we're using to play. So when you talk about that max velocity and you say, yeah, maybe he's not you know, going that fast, his distance is very high, so he's clearly working, right? There's a lot of work being done. The intensity of that work is variable, right? And this is a great point with different, not only positionally, but with certain players. Do we see that we have players that are very sprint oriented versus very much uh, uh, more continuous movement? And again, function of a holding midfielder yeah, you can see that within the train, same training session. It's a little bit more easier to look at within a game situation, right? And we'll have some of that to be able to see because the roles are clearly defined in a game. Uh, yes, and, and again, I think the answer is yes, but it depends. It's drill dependent as well. Right, so, so that's, that's the piece that we'll look at. So we'll look at a couple examples because I think it's gonna answer kind of what you're talking about as we're going through here. So this is our second player, the attacking midfielder in, right? Again, now look at the difference, same session, right? So again, if we were to outlay this session, I can tell you we did our physical warm up period. We did a, a technical, right, passing drill in there. We did a possessional game. We did a transitional game. And then we did a, kind of a match simulation, like a scrimmage as we go through there. So in this point in time, this same player, right, Nine kilometers for a holding midfielder, this same player, 5.68, okay? At the same time, his max speed was higher, 26.4, right, going through. But again, the physical demands, it's what we ask them to do in this session. So the difference between players, what you have to see is, my question isn't, are they giving us what we need them to give us? My question is, are we putting them in an environment to get what we want out of them? Because my first assumption as a coach, and maybe this is my biggest flaw, but I really believe that our players are gonna give us everything that we ask. The question is, is are we asking the right things, right? Are we asking them to give us the right things? So again, as we go through, we see those speed variations in here. And just to break it down now, we've got, this is our physical warm up comparison as we go through. So again, looking at what we did, we've got a little uh, 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 course set up, pull ups, push ups, single leg squats, things that's on the outside. It's set up in a little track. So I know that every time we do one lap around it, it's 100 meters, uh, we go through there. But we can again see this, and relatively in here, right, the distances are pretty equitable in there, the speeds are pretty equitable, the heart rates are pretty even as we go through. So this particular drill in this session, you know, back to your point, is that they were giving us the same amount of work here relatively, right? Their efforts appear to be very similar as well in there as we go through. So from that point, when we saw the difference between nine and five or six kilometers we go through, it wasn't in this piece that we did, right? So we take a look at the next piece, the technical piece, okay? Now, in the technical piece, one of my big points is what we wanna be able to manipulate to manipulate speed and intensity and volume is the space, okay? So this is the space that we use for our technical warm up as we go through, right? Not atypical, right? Very typical spacing as far as the warm up goes in. But again, what do we get? Look at heart rate responses, very, very low. I mean, he's uh, uh, below 60% here as we go through uh, for our attacking midfielder. Our holding midfielder, right, starts to go through towards the end of the session or at the end of the, the, the piece here, the exercise. Obviously, we pick up the intensity and you can see that uh, as it flows through as well. But again, just a little comparison of what is the drill asking us? And that's the question. What is the drill asking of us as we go through?
Next, we go to the 8v8 plus 3, right? So very possessional, right, oriented drill. And again, what do we get out of 8v8 plus 3? You know what? What we typically get out of 8v8 plus 3, it's a great recovery exercise because we tend to see that we get a good amount of cardiovascular effort coming out of the piece, right? A good amount of cardiovascular exertion. But we don't necessarily see, right, speeds are relatively low, average speeds are relatively low because it's a possessional exercise, right? You play, you move, but you don't transition as you go through. So, you know, again, again, in the space required here, right, we've got a little complexity because the numbers, if you're looking at uh, 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 19 players, right, within about a 40 by 40 yard grid. So again, not a whole lot of space for sprinting and opening up, but we do see some good action coming in there. But now we also start to see, to your point, is our guy working? What happens here? Look, difference, right? Active, active, active. He stops here, he stops here. So there's a couple points where he stops very briefly, right, as we go through, right? This player, we see a lot more where he goes to zero velocity as we go through, right? So potentially he's playing in the corner, and this is actually his heat map here, right? But you see all the red spots here? He's standing, okay? You don't see that here as we go through. So to your point, can you tell if somebody's working? Well, this you could certainly look at that and come to that conclusion. Okay, so the next one we look at uh, uh, the transitional exercise we did. And again, difference between players, we're starting to see them open up a little bit more as we come in. Okay, this player covers uh, uh, one and a half kilometers here. He covers a half a kilometer during this exercise in. This is what he's doing over the course of the exercise. This is what he's doing. In this transitional exercise, what happens? 60, uh, 64 plus 64. He's one of our players who's building the game, who's transitioning the game. So he's involved when we transition into attack. He's involved when we transition into defense. Our first player here, right, attacking midfielder, what's his role? He's involved when we transition into the attack. Okay, so what we ask of them, it's the same drill, but what we start to get out of that drill from two different players are two very different things. Okay? So we start to see that separate as we go through. And then as we come in, right, we go through a little bit of our match simulation. And again, you can see over the course of this time, what happened here is we actually had this player come and rest in, right? Why do we have this player rest? This is, this, is, uh, this is the interesting fact of all this stuff, right? Why we had this player rest, right? This is a guy who is a very explosive, he's our playmaker, right? Very important to the team. What does our coach not want to have him do over the course of time, right? He doesn't want to overwork him, right? But our defensive midfielder, what is his role in the team? His role is to be a workhorse, okay? So what do we do with him? We work him, right? He stays in, he's the warrior, he battles, he fights the whole game, right? What's the other guy's responsibility? His responsibility is create. And what do we actually get from those two different players, right? It's two very different responses. So the coach says, hey, I wanna be careful with you because you need to create. You're a workhorse, keep going, right? As we go through. And so we start to see that separation go. Now. What effect does that have? Again, that's something that we're looking into a lot more. We're talking about, uh, I've got a great team of people that's, that's uh, behind me helping to look at some of this data and analyze it and look for trends, right? Uh, look at different factors that potentially contribute to whether we did enough or whether we didn't do enough. But this kind of starts to give us a little bit of that summary as we go through. Uh, okay, so now let's look at this match concept, right? So now we're starting to look at trends over time. So we looked at the individual session and we did interplayer comparison. Now we start to look at some trends over time as we're going through. So this is one of our players in the course of a match. This is his first half, this is his second half. Now this is the holding midfielder we've been looking at as we go through. And you can see during the course of the first half, we're defending this, uh, this side of the field. We see him positioned in here, second half, right? We're defending this side, but we get him a little bit more forward. Obviously I picked a match we did well in, right? Uh, we, we won, we can see some of those differences in. But again, you see his activity profile here and his heart rate profile from the first half to the second half. And what do we start to do? We can look now at his speed zones, the zones he was in certain speeds here. First half, right? Now look, he gets into that zone five, real fast speed. Now this isn't the guy who gets up there very often. Why? Because it's not his job, he's a holder, right? That's what his, you know, he takes that transition. So his speeds don't necessarily get up there, but you can see, right, this work rate, right? This kind of work component in. And what happens, right? We see this period comes, and then the next period, there's still some good work, but there's a little drop off, right? High intensity period, 
a little drop off recovery. So broken up over five minute intervals over the half, we see that fluctuation happen, okay? Second half, what do we see? Okay, maybe now the second half, we see lower work rates. Why do we see lower work rates? Maybe the game becomes more tactical at that point, right? Maybe we've done, made some changes, maybe the other team has changed some changes. So it's very difficult to say why in the second half this happened. I can tell you the score line at this point was still 0-0. Zero, zero. So it wasn't a factor of score line as we go through. But we do see that variation in performance as we go through. And what ultimately we're looking for is, was he capable of high intensity sprints or high intensity effort in the second half, right? Or do we start to see some fatigue set in, in that second half? So here's our other player, our attacking midfield as we go through. And now look at the velocity zones here, right? Look at that middle, those middle bar sections. Attacking midfielder, holding midfielder. Attacking midfielder, holding midfielder, okay? So again, right, you see the demands on this player from a sprint standpoint are very, very high, right? So now we go back and we say, okay, in that training session, one player covered nine kilometers and one player covered five, right? Maybe it starts to make sense now with that player's role is he has to be max velocity guy, right? He has to be able to sprint, recover, sprint, recover as we go through, right? So those demands on him, right, from not only neuromuscular, uh, musculoskeletal, but an energy system standpoint are much different than the other players we go through. Okay, uh, next player I threw in just another player here just to show you this is an outside back, right? And again, outside back, you look at his velocities, especially in the first parts of the first half and the second half, and they're very high, right? Again, compare that across the board here, first half to second half, and that first 15 minutes of the first and the second half, right, his velocities are very high as he's going in there, right? We see some stabilization. There's a couple periods where, again, things pick up as we go through, but, you know, again, the point is what we're looking at is, is just identifying some of these trends over time. Not necessarily trying to make sense of them right now, but saying, hey, what is actually happening over the course of time as we go through? So when we talk about that trend over time concept, right, now let's take a look at rather than that, that individual session, what happened in that individual session, not just what happened first half to second half, but now what happened over the course of several weeks as we went in. So this is about the last month of our season. So you can see we're distributed here between speed zones. So how many times he's in a high zone to lower threshold zone over the course of the season, right? One player versus another as we go through. And what we're looking at, so we see those speed zones in here. Clearly match, 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 right? This is really interesting. This was actually the American uh, semifinal and final matches that we played in. And we can see that that Friday to Sunday, actually the speed zones increased in that Sunday match which is a, probably a pretty good thing, right? I mean, I can sit here and say, I did a great job with the team this week because we did more than that. But look, that's a little bit myopic, right? There's a lot of other variables that go into why that match potentially was more open from those speed zones. Look at the distances covered, right? This is covered in this light blue line here. Again, our training match, right? We've got a training session, training session, a day off, right? We come in before the training session, right? Distance very low, we get the match, we get a day off we take it through as we go through, okay? So this is looking at that now. So what happens to our distance in those matches over the course of time, right? You can see that relatively, they're relatively stable. There's some fluctuation, but they're relatively stable, right? So the one question is, if we could not physically perform, then we would see a decline, right? We may be able to physically perform and still see a, see a decline, but the fact that we didn't see a decline doesn't mean that we at least were able to physically perform in those matches we go through. And that's one of the big questions, is how do we manage these training loads over the season? And this is one of the ways that we used to look at who's decreasing over the course of time. Look at now is maximum velocity. This is another key indicator that we look at. Do we see this max velocity trend over time start to drop? And again, we see for him, this was our attacking midfielder again, relatively stable over the course of time. Of course, there's variation from match to match as we go through, but again, you see from match to match to match to match, right, that those maximum velocities are still pretty stable as we go through. So, uh, you know, again, gives us an idea of, of how we're loading the player, how he's responding to the load as we go through. Heart rate exertion, right, or TRIMP, uh, the, the heart rate training load that we get, 
Again, same two players we saw in the last graph. Again, big difference in that variability of the effort that's coming out of these positions. Okay, so again, right? One player, top player, outside left back. Bottom player, attacking midfielder, right? So clearly you see the points in the course of the match, right? Match, 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 right? Where again, his output during the course of the matches is, or his effort during the course of the matches is staying relatively high. His output's also staying high. So the big question is, as we go through, right? We talked about these training load features that we looked at. Um, but uh, the, the whole training load feature of, of, of the stress that we put on our players, right? I mean, basically when we are talking about how we train our team, we're talking about how we're gonna stress them. Are we gonna stress them in tight spaces? Are we gonna stress them in transition? Are we gonna stress them physically, right? And that's my job. How do we stress them physically, right? Do we, do we give them a, a high heart rate load? Do we give them a high speed load? Some of those things. So in understanding the training load, it's understanding stress and how we respond and adapt to stress, right? And this is now kind of putting it together. Okay, we know individually the information we can get. We see some trends over time. Now the question is, well, what's the right thing to do, right? Uh, and you know, the, the best uh, uh, analogy I've heard uh, came in, in uh, this guy who's pretty high up in the field says, uh, you know what, there's no recipe. You have to learn how to cook, right? So we have the variables that are going on in here. One of the big factors is we've got to figure out how to put those variables together. The most challenging part of our jobs is that our team does not respond uniformly, right? Our team responds individually. And we saw that variation with workloads between individual over the course of different, not only matches, but also over the course of different training sessions. So how we modify that becomes very difficult to do. And when we get back to the premise of this whole thing, using training or using technology to monitor daily training session loads, it's those players that we're looking for. It's those players that when we have our player who's got a very, uh, our attacking midfielder, who sprints a whole lot during the games and not necessarily a whole lot during the course of the week, right? Is that enough for him? Do we, do we do that too much with him? So big thing that we know about stress and stress adaptation, how we respond to stress, how do we respond to stress? We get fatigued, right? So whatever we're doing out there, we put a load on them, we're gonna see some fatigue. How we adapt to it, right? We see them come back and we see them super compensate as we go through. So basic periodization principle here, but we see that. So over the course of the season, how do we apply those loads? How do we facilitate their recovery? Because these are all the things that in my job, in my role, how much do we load the players, right? And how do we facilitate them to recover so that when it comes to game time, they're at their peak readiness state to perform well. Doesn't mean they're gonna perform well, it means they're physically capable of performing well, right? So it becomes a little bit difficult to make some, uh, 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 you know, real, real finite uh, uh, statements about what it is. But we want to put them. What if we had a match at this point, right? Well, our performance potential is going to be lower. Doesn't mean we're going to perform lower, but it means that we're less likely to perform well. So those are a couple of things. The one thing I want to hit up is as we get uh, kind of moving through, and the next session I do, this kind of leads into that is how we apply these stresses and what are our responses to these stresses? What happens after a game, right? What happens to some of the physical characteristics that we have from the beginning of the season to the end of the season? What happens to our fitness level from the preseason to the postseason? What happens to our explosive ability? So these are things that we're gonna get into. But as we talk about this stress, it's really also important to consider, we talk about training stress, but stress is stress, right? Stress is like an allergy. It doesn't matter if you're allergic to dust, pollen, grass, what happens? Right, same response, your eyes start running, nose get a little bit, uh, and that's the same thing with stress. So we have to also have to understand with the population that we're dealing with, and that I'm dealing with in particular, right, with, with college students and college athletes, is that stress comes from multiple sources, psychological, emotional, environmental stress, physical stress. So we do as much as we can to control environmental stress. Uh, we look at, at uh, some of the things that we actually do, or uh, we'll do a heat chamber test with our guys to see what their stress tolerance is for heat you know, how adapted and acclimated they are for, for training in the heat, we'll do that. Uh, some of the emotional stress, right, that also sometimes becomes my, my job as well as some of the psychological stress. Although if you know the coach that I work under, right, psychological stress probably tends to stay very high over the course of the season, but it's how we manage these things as we go through and what we manage in the course of the game. We're talking just about that physical component of managing stress. How do we keep our maximal speed of action high? 
right? Which is our anaerobic power ability. How does that stay high? How do we keep that high as we go through? Because that's important. How do we keep our ability to maintain that high speed of action over the course of a match? We saw some of the trends over the course of the game. We see high speed action followed by low speed action, right? In those, in those uh, uh, five minute breakdowns we go through to there, we see that. And then from an aerobic capacity, we see different heart rate loads that we put on players, right? They need that ability to recover, right? That metabolic ability to recover so that they can sprint again. But again, we're always talking about that high intensity intermittent load as we go through. So as that gets into the next uh, one, um, we're gonna kind of leave it at that one. And I just wanna say uh, thank you for your time. You know, again, I think that the, the major factor that, um, you know, I kind of wanna get across is, uh, look, we're, we're capable, how do we measure this stuff, right? Uh, and, and, and what types of things, what type of parameters can we use to measure how much we're loading our players? Yes? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, one of the big factors that, that we talk about with, with all these things, certainly it's, it's that overall stress component, right? And, and what, we, what we do from a physical training load stress component contributes to that. But a lot of times it's these other factors that tend to, uh, that tend to wear on players over the time. I mean, you know, remember back to college when you were in uh, uh, your 14th week of 16 weeks of school, you're like, I just want this to be done, you know? And what time, yeah, what time is that for us, right? That 14th of 16 weeks is NCAA round two, you know? So a lot of what we work on doing is managing that recovery process, helping them manage that stress. What we tend to see that in more is we will ask them, part of the other information that we, we collect is we'll ask them what their stress level is, very simply. What's your stress level? What's your fatigue level? What's your soreness level? And that helps us to answer the question of how much stress are they under? And we can look at our training loads and say, do we see training loads increasing and their soreness increasing? Do we see the number of matches we play in, in the course of a week? Does that change their fatigue level? Uh, and knowing that, we need to have an intervention, right? Okay, so we know that, right? The guy's gonna be tired, but what do you do? You know, so we've tried to incorporate a lot more interventions this year, massage, yoga, Lots and lots of uh, cold plunge type of stuff. We have recovery pants that we wear to and from games and et cetera. But a lot of that goes into, you know, look, we're not gonna be able to change our game structure until the NCAA goes through the split season, right? So we've gotta be able to figure out how best to manage our players during that course of time. Yes? Yeah, we'll, we'll give them game reports of their game, uh, distance, action, et cetera. Um, what I'm a little bit more hesitant at times to give them uh, daily session reports of what they've done over the course of the week. And, and of course, everyone kind of, it's common sense why you would not do that, right? Because if we get in a situation where a guy comes up and, and it's like, you know what? You are absolutely in the red on everything. Right, and you know what? There's nothing we're gonna do about it at that point. If I need to take a player aside and say, look, right, we're seeing the soreness increase. Are you doing these things we're talking about from recovery, or can I give you the day off, right? Those are decisions that I can make, that I can talk to them. But to your point, what we, what we do is uh, we'll flag players for different things. And I'll tell you, the biggest thing that I'll do is when I say a player come flagged in, his heart rate load is high for that week, his distance is high for that week, right? His sprint distance is high for that week. Right, his vertical jump that week went down. You know what, we, so it looks like a chicken, it smells like a chicken, it tastes like a chicken, right? It's probably not in a good spot. And, and you know, most of the time we see two variables. I'm always trying to interview our players at the beginning of sessions because I wanna see ultimately how they feel and where they're responding. But I may go up to a player and he's flagged red in three categories and I'll put my arm around, hey, you know, how's it going, how you doing? Great, I'm fine. You know, how the legs feel? Good, no problem. You sore, you tight? No, nothing. Good. Well, you know what? Am I going to pull this guy out because I see he's got three? You know, these. So, look. In the end, this data information capture, this technology allows us to ask better questions, right? And allows us to ask and identify the players that that we need to make sure we're managing as we go through. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, we do. But I'll be honest with you. What, what we've kind of found with that is um, there are sometimes it's not a happy medium. After a game, some player, how, you know, how tired are you? How much of the, 100%. I'm done, right? Uh, it doesn't necessarily, and it doesn't matter, right, that the game was uh, lower or higher, right, workload or effort when we measure our stuff as we go in there. So, you know, certainly that is a factor. What we tend to look at that number with more is trend over time and how that uh, corresponds to that training load that we're putting on them. Um, it's not... And I'll be really honest with you, you know, I've got nothing to hide here. One of our big problems with our players was I feel like they started answering these questions. I've got to find a better way to ask them the question. Because it just was like, yeah, there, you know? Yeah, so, um, so there's, there's. Yeah. Yeah, I have a number of players that will come up and ask to see their information, especially for matches, right? That's the big one. And, and we also have the pro zone uh, stats. So, you know, what's cool, and I'll show this uh, slide in the next presentation as well, is we'll look at some of the game performance variables, right? We'll look at our team performance variables, our possession rate, our final third entries, our penalty entries, our shots on goal, uh, our, our hustle board, right? Tackles, headers, interceptions, clearances. We'll look at those variables, and we'll also uh, put in those with the physical variables of distance covered, Sprints, sprint distance covered. And again, is there, if you sprint more, you get here more. You know what, no, there's, there's not really that straightforward trend. But we do, you know, it is interesting to see over the course of these matches, and the players are very interested in it. You know, everybody's into the, you know, phone technology and, and those things now, so. Yeah, yes. Yes, yes, and that that's a big part of my next uh, my next presentation. So I don't want to, you know, do it all. But uh, but you know, I will tell you absolutely. This is the this is the critical thing, right? Is you have players, and everybody knows how many how many scholarships you have in NCAA Division One soccer. Nine point nine, right? So what's your depth look like from fifteen to twenty? Right? I mean, there's a pretty big drop off. Right? There's a pretty big drop off. You know, and, and I think you even see that now in the MLS, a drop off between your you know DPS and and some of your homegrown players. I mean could be very different as we go through. But the point is, is that those uh, really 13 to 15 players get the absolute lion's share of the minutes during the course of the matches. So when you're playing three point matches a week and you're not playing, yeah, how do you manage those guys really becomes the trick. You know, so those outliers are, are kind of really what we're looking at. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll tell you, just so you know, you wanna get the preview is that uh, the guys that we really have to be concerned about are our reserves, right? So we categorize starters, reserves, and depth players, right? Starters are getting enough load during the course of the week just through matches, right? Reserves, or the substitutions, they'll go into a match maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, right? But do we train them harder the day before a match because we only know they're gonna play 20 minutes? And it's something we've gotta do a better job with that, that this showed us clearly that you know what? No, no, this guy is in the starting rotation he may play, so we're not gonna have him do as much in practice. The other thing that happens in the course of practice is if you're a reserve, you're playing with the first team against the depth players on the second team. So what are you doing? You're, you're a reserve in practice, right? I'm gonna rotate in for this guy to play with the first team, so that becomes a real significant issue, absolutely. Good? Okay, well I'll be here for a couple minutes, happy to answer any more questions, and again, thanks for your time today. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of it.